Super excited to uh, do this info session with all of you. This is um, uh, a, a program that was started in 2017. It's a fully funded uh, position as a doctoral student in preservation at GSUB. It's a five-year program. Uh, and during those five years, the, um, the, the candidate will have you know, tuition paid for, plus a stipend uh, that will help with living expenses. This is the school. Many of you may be familiar with it, but this is Columbia University's campus. The little blue arrow is where Avery Hall is, and I am this window over here. This window over here is, is that window right there. So now you can, you can place me. The, uh, the PhD program is housed in the Preservation Technology Lab at GSAP. Uh, the Preservation Technology Lab is both a research facility, it's a teaching facility, and it's a resource uh, for the PhD students. It's a resource for master's students and as well as for the school in general. But it speaks to the nature of the PhD program. The PhD program really is focused on experimentation, is focused on the intersection between preservation, art, architecture, technology, the fields of the built environment, but really bringing together uh, art and technology and, and preservation and its ramifications and implications in the world, which might involve historical questions, policy questions, uh, environmental questions, et cetera. It is a future looking PhD program. So you're really to imagine, you know, we are looking for uh, research projects, student research projects that are gonna be really looking to the future, future leaning, but of course are gonna be informed you know, by historical research and an engagement in the material world. The lab is has an incredible collection of materials. Uh, it also is involved in the kind of long wedge of the future of uh, digital literacy and digital technology. So bringing together this material in digital world in a series of experiments that can be grounded in our discipline of preservation and grounded in the problems and the issues that that articulate our current reality. So as you think about your application, this is really something to keep in mind and something to keep in mind in relationship to the fact that this is also self-guided um, um, it's it's independent work. So in other words, the PhD program is not is not structured um, like in some of the sciences where you're coming in and doing work that that, um, that is a larger project that you are um, let's say doing just a little sliver of. Like you know, the a faculty might have a research grant in the sciences. That's not how we work. We're really looking to hear from you. What is your research project? Um, and, and how does being at Columbia uh, make it possible for you to carry out that research project? So a big part of this, of course, is also Avery Library. Uh, that's the other research base and a lot of students are gonna be involved. Uh, it is one of the premier uh, preservation, architecture, art libraries in the world. Uh, it has a tremendous archive. It has um, obviously a collection, but a lot of the original drawings, original manuscripts, uh, materials uh, of, of um, the disciplines of the built environment are stored here in, in the archive. So archival work is also of, of the program itself. Now the school is spread across a number of different buildings. And so just this is this, this is Avery Hall over here. We have spaces here in this building, this building, and this building. And where you see the SX, that's where the preservation technology lab is. And that's where the PhD program is housed. So as I mentioned, the PhD in historic preservation is housed in the preservation technology lab. 
It's a five-year program, fully funded position for one student. We admit, admit one student per year um, that conducts research that is proposed by the student. Uh, research that has to do with experimental preservation, advancing experimental preservation, thinking about experimentation as a grounded practice that involves bringing together preserva preservation, art, architecture, and the field of the built environment in relationship to issues that are critical to our time. And so those might be questions of environment, climate change, it might be questions of equity, uh, they might be other questions that you bring to the fore. As you put together your application, which is, you know, the topic that is, is pressing on all of your minds, think about what that project is in relationship, of course, to your background, what you bring to the to that research, but also what Columbia's preservation program and graduate school of architecture, preserva uh, planning and preservation can offer to you. So think about our resources. Think about how our resources are helpful to you. So think about what the preservation technology lab can bring to your research practice. I'll have the next. Think about also uh, what Avery Library can bring to your research. Think about the archives, the, 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 the collections that are in Avery Library and how they might be relevant to your research project. And think about, and I'll have the next, most importantly, who do you want to work with? The faculty that are here. Next slide, please. So the faculty, there's a number of full-time faculty here that I encourage you to familiarize yourself with. Obviously myself, I'm the director of the program, um, Jorge Terapilos, um, and um, I practice at the intersection of preservation, art, and architecture, thinking about the ways in which art and technology can be ways of advancing preservation, but also of questioning the very practice of preservation, questioning the very assumptions of preservation, and beginning to move the field forward through that uh, critical engagement. And so um, there are a number of books here on the screen that uh, you might be interested in and in becoming familiar with as you put in together your, your application. Experimental preservation is one of them, but also the, the more recent historic preservation theory anthology, which really puts an emphasis on the, on the intellectual dimensions of the field. So every act of preservation. Preservation is a practice, of course, but that practice is an intellectual practice. It's informed by ideas. It is a praxis in that sense, and not necessarily only a practice that is repetitive and about acquiring specific skills, but a praxis that is informed by theoretical premises and pushing through praxis those theoretical premises forward. So you'll find some of that in, <clears throat> in that book. Let's have the next, please. And so the different kinds of projects that uh, you might find um, in among the faculty, and here some of mine, here has to do with preserving and thinking about materiality, the materiality of the environment, the materiality of dust, dust as an architectural material, as a fragment. Dust is one of the pollution, that, that, that kind of dust is something that comes first and then comes architecture. Before you put a brick on a job site, you have to manufacture that brick and you have to make pollution. So it's part of, it's not really just the supply chain. It is part of architecture because actually when the brick goes onto the building, you then have to heat or cool that building and make more pollution in the process. So you can't really Pollution comes before architecture, but is also in, in, enmeshed in the very process of sustaining the built environment. And so how do we account for that pollution as a significant aspect of our built environment and begin to think about it through a preservation lens? So some of these projects that have to do with collecting the dust on buildings, beginning to both think of them aesthetically, so encountering their materiality as an aesthetic um, 
um, composition, but then also beginning to understand them technologically uh, as a cleaning technique through, through that latex that is applied as a poultice to remove the dust and also to begin to analyze this as a record, as an environmental record. So this is a project that through preservation begins to raise questions about what do we assign value to? What are the materials that are considered character defining uh, materials in historic preservation? This is a, a, a way to begin to think about pollution as a big part of our environment. Of course, pollution doesn't just sit on the lot line, but it kind of moves around in the air. So it forces us to start thinking about what is the object of preservation itself, and so to move beyond buildings to the whole of the built environment and to move also from the, the, the land as a way to establish what is, you know, what do we preserve and not in terms of, you know, lot lines and, and maps that look down, but also to look up at the sky and to think about how the whole of the sky might be something that we need to begin to engage as a material reality, as a constructed reality and one worth preserving. And of course, there's a long history of this in preservation. We love to talk about uh, view sheds, and we talk about um, uh, large swaths of, of, of air, you know, when we talk about a historic view shed. So all of these are ways to begin to think about the object of preservation in a way that that is not necessarily bound to a particular monument or building, but certainly encompassing of that and beginning to push that forward. Let's have the next, please. And then, of course, you know, there are other kinds of projects that, that have to do with entering into a dialogue with this. So uh, many of us on the faculty have professional practices on the side. So it, in my studio, you know, we've been collaborating on the preservation of buildings internationally. This is the U.S. Embassy in Oslo, where I actually um, uh, engaged in a dialogue with the Norwegian national authorities about the preservation of a fence, which you cannot see in this photograph, which was put up right after the, the building was constructed and was not deemed important to the preservation of the fence of the of the embassy. And so through art, we were able to preserve the fence and integrate it as part of what is a relevant piece of this architecture uh, and what is the kind of ideas that are made uh, possible to transmit over time, because certainly that is something that we in preservation are concerned with. Uh, through the very materialities of, of our built environment. And of course, the idea of thinking through art as a method and design as a method of preservation is one of also pushing the practices of, of preservation, the assumptions about what has value or not. So we're definitely looking for projects that are along those lines, thinking about those assumptions, being critical of those assumptions, and thinking about how art, design, technology can begin to push those uh, that discipline, our discipline forward. Let's have the next. Uh, other full-time faculty include uh, Erica Avrami. And um, Erica is focused on community-engaged research and in thinking about policy questions uh, and how when we as preservationists work at the systemic level of writing policy, we actually uh, sometimes set goals for ourselves and don't go back and check on those goals. And so her work deals with really thinking about what goals are set in the field and then trying to assess whether we've accomplished them and reorganizing, rethinking, how do we rethink policy in order to achieve those goals more intentionally and working with communities listening to communities, working from the from the ground up to build those those policies. So this means that her work enters into uh, critical assessments of contemporary practices in preservation, contemporary policies, contemporary institutions um, to to really move them forward and through through a critical engagement. And so uh, she works very internationally through bodies like UNESCO and World Monuments and also more locally at, at municipal and state levels or national levels through that process. It is, it is um, a process that then leads to dif different kinds of research outputs that, um, that are you know, books or, or um, in different reports, but that uh, Erica is intentionally focused along a series of questions such as, uh, 
equity, um, the narratives, the social narratives um, that have been left out by, by um, a kind of top-down preservation uh, institutions, uh, and also climate change. So she works uh, through technologies such as GIS, visualization mapping, and other kinds of data gathering. She's really thinking about how data is part of the um, uh, part of the way that we inform policy, but data itself is problematic and comes with a lot of bias, and we need to engage with it. So there's a lot of the students that are, you know, interested in these questions of data will find, um, you know, she really look at the, you know, Erica's work. And let's have the next. Um, some of the other faculty in the um, in the program. Oh, here we go. It looks like there is a delay in, in this. So um, I don't know how we, we move that forward, but some of the other faculty which are affiliated as a part of the PhD in preservation are Lola Benalon, who is an engineer and an artist and directs the Nat Natural Materials Lab uh, within, the, within the school. Uh, very connected to the Preservation Technology Lab. She's interested in sustainable materials uh, and the way that those sustainable materials affect social formations and institutional relationships. So she is very much within this experimental preservation uh, fold. Mabel Wilson, um, who uh, is both professor at GSEP and professor of African-American and African diasporic studies. Uh, and director of the Institute of Research in African American Studies and co-director of the Global Africa Lab. So Mabel's work really looks at the way in which um, racialization is part of the modernization project of the Enlightenment and how we begin to engage with it in critical ways so as to think about uh, how we as a discipline begin to move beyond the the through and beyond the, the, the problematic relationships that are set up when racialization becomes a, a means of structuring uh, knowledge. So theoretical, but at the same time, very engaged in practical questions. Maybe we'll also led a, uh, a whole research project on, on who builds your architecture. So the question of labor and who does the labor and, and uh, and certainly that in, in touches upon who does labor in preservation. Uh, Lucia Ale, who is an architectural historian and um, has been doing a number of different um, projects on various materials uh, that are more historically oriented. So using historical research as a way to upend or critique or rethink how we consider materials um, and historic materials and the, the flows of materials through our built environment um, as institutional flows, as social flows, as political flows, as environmental flows. So she's been working on concrete for a number of years. She also published a book called Designs of Destruction, which looks at the way in which um, uh, and at, at the ways in which the United Nations and, and UNESCO really set up a whole uh, infrastructure coming out of World War II to, to, protect the, um, to protect world heritage as a geopolitical uh, move. So she's very interested in these intersections between materiality, preservation, and uh, the political economies. Uh, she's currently running a, um, a um, major conference, set of conferences on the question of land as a material. So land differently conceived as soil, uh, as property, uh, et cetera. Uh, so these are, these are some of the figures. We can talk more about them if you ask um, in the Q&A. But you would want to think about how these, uh, uh, this faculty will be able to move your project along. Obviously, there are intersections here among all the faculties that, that we are interested in, the question of materiality, the question of materials, the question of the digital, the question of how art intersects with that, the aesthetic dimension, uh, and the experimental dimension, the art and technology bringing forth different um, experimental projects that begin to 
um, test and contest uh, preservation praxis and also preservation ideas, preservation theory. So let's go to the next. There is also a broader PhD faculty in the school, which you should be aware of. And of course, um, you're going to, you don't have to identify an advisor when you apply. You will figure out when you, um, you know, when you're here, who will actually, um, you, you will want to, you know, work with more closely. But here are some of the people that are uh, affiliated with, with the program. They're both at GSAP. They're at Barnard and they're at the Department uh, of Art and Archaeology. There are others that we could uh, direct you to, but these are people that are teaching PhD level courses that intersect with preservation in one way or another. There's uh, Kenneth Frampton is no longer on the faculty. He retired recently. So this, this list is, um, can, just bear that in mind. Next, go to the next. Next slide, please. Yes, and then there's, of course, the um, Master of Science in Historic Preservation faculty as well, um, who you should be familiar with. They're all on the website and also research centers. So very strong applications to the program will also begin to imagine how by being cited in the preservation technology lab and focused on experimental preservation research projects, these your research project will connect two different research centers and institutes at Columbia University. Um, and that will make it very a, a strong application. Why? Because it will show to us that this can only happen at Columbia because of the various research infrastructures that are here, the different people that are here, that this is the place where you really need to do that research. So this gives you a sense of the different research centers. Uh, and again, each student will have a different way of framing their research project. And we will help you once you get here, connect to some of those people at those other research centers and institutes and bring them into your research project. So let's go to the next. So please familiarize yourself with these research centers and institutes. So just a, an outline of the program real quick. Here we go. Could we have the next uh, slide, please? You're probably all familiar with this already. Um, it is a five-year program. You take classes for the first two years. During your third year, you are taking exams. You're so-called qualifying exams, uh, which enable you then to move to your dissertation phase, what's called ABD, all but dissertation. And then you have two years to write that dissertation for a total of five years. During the first two years when you're taking classes there are some required classes that you must take. There are PhD colloquium, which is a methods class in preservation, and then some other doctoral uh, colloquia in GSAP and some electives in and outside of the Graduate School of Architecture, uh, Planning and Preservation and within the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, uh, you can also take classes. Now, during your first year, you don't teach. During the second and third year, you will be teaching. So this is also part of the PhD program is to train the next generation of scholars. So we are interested in people who want to pursue an academic career, an academic career that has many, many ramifications, of course, because you can go, the, you know, that is more research oriented. Uh, but certainly the, we are looking for the people who are going to shape the preservation discipline in the future. Um, so here you have some of the other requirements. I mentioned the duration in the MPhil exams. There's also a language requirement. So you need to speak a foreign language and pass that. It's uh, you have to have it at the reading level. So you have to understand texts. You don't necessarily have to speak it. Uh, and then, um, you know, the, the PhD requirement. There is a, there is a, a, a time limit. So we, we wanna make sure that you're finished in five years. Sometimes things happen. We just had a pandemic. Some people had to have extensions. We would definitely want to make sure you finish before seven years. So this is, think of it as a, is this is a long-term commitment. You are 
not your it's 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 work you're you're but it's also a great deal of fun you're going to be uh, learning it's exciting you get to devote all of your time to your research with a great faculty that is really committed to helping you advance your research project and in the company of a great group of a cohort of other PhD students. So we currently have three PhD students in the program um, and they are listed on our website. Let's go to the next. And so I invite you to please familiarize yourselves with them and their, uh, their projects. Um, this is just to signal to you that you want to just think about the mix of classes that you might be uh, taking. So what are the kinds of classes that are being offered here that might be in, 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 uh, informing your research project? What are the what is the knowledge that you need to be able to move your research project forward? So look at the classes that are being offered in GSAP to, to imagine who you might want to take classes with. Really plan this out. Go ahead and next. I think we can skip through these GSAP elective classes because they're really meant for people to, to have a moment to just uh, to make sure you look at those. Now, you will all be putting together an admissions uh, dossier. And uh, so we're very interested uh, in, in learning about you, uh, but more importantly, what you bring to this research project. So this is really about the, you know, how you're going to, uh, your interest and desire to put together a experimental preservation research project, how do you define that? How do you define experimental preservation? What are the disciplines that you are connecting? What is your background? How are you putting together these different, um, you know, strands and threads to advance um, this, this research project? We will want transcripts, but the key here is B, is your statement of academic purpose. This is something that I really want to draw your attention to. This is where you describe your research project. And, and that description should really show that you know what the discipline is about, that you are familiar with some key texts in the discipline, some key projects, and that you've identified a missing component within this experimental preservation research area that you want to advance. Um, and so you want to state that in, that's what your statement of academic purpose should really lay out. This is, think of it as a dissertation proposal. Now I say that, and I put it in brackets because we all know that this might change when you get here, this might be something completely different. You'll take classes that will rearrange and you'll end up doing something maybe slightly different. That's totally okay, but we definitely want you to have a clear and intentional purpose coming in. Five years sounds like a long time. It goes by in a, in a blink of an eye. So we really want you to be intentional and directed coming in and to know what you, what you want to do. Tell us how you see the field. Tell us who you see are you know, the major uh, players in this in in this field of experimental preservation research praxis action and what is missing what what do you want to bring in in terms of methodology or how you bring together art and technology and materials and and uh, perhaps design policy history how do you envision that um, and who do you want to work with and what are the institutes and centers that you want to bring together in 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 to advance your project and what are what are the kinds of archives uh, pro well, how do you want to structure this so the more you tell us the better obviously your curriculum vitae is important uh three letters of recommendation from academic sources please ask people who who've conducted a phd that can speak to your ability to conduct doctoral level work i suggest that you Call these people and you ask them point blank, do they feel comfortable writing a strong letter of recommendation for you? Um, you know, you, what you don't want is somebody writing a letter of recommendation for you that's lukewarm. And you don't want people that don't know you writing letters of recommendation. So these are people who are your champions that, that you want to really reach out to. Um, 
uh, if you're an international student, you have to show proof that you can speak English. Um, GREs, you don't have to take it if you haven't. If you have, we're we're very happy to 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 see it. Uh, but that's not a major. Um, uh, that's not for us something we're really looking at. It's the statement of academic purpose, your CV, those letters that are really the focus of our attention, and the writing sample. Uh, these can be a writing sample, these can be projects, these can be designs, they can be things that you've done, um, but you, if it's the project, just don't just send a few pictures of a project, you know, send a project narrative that's really articulating how this relates to your statement of academic purpose, to your research project, okay? Um, then this is a bit of the schedule, you know, you'll apply, um, um, and you will hear back by, by March. Uh, 